this is Paul Glasgow. And I'm Chad Marino. We're out here at the Crawfish Cup. The NRA Action Pistol Regionals. At the Southwest Louisiana uh, Gun Club. And, and man, what a great time we're having out here. We got to speak with Doug Koenig a few minutes ago. If you don't know anything about Doug Koenig, stay tuned to the show. You're going you're gonna to learn a little bit more about him. But those of you that know him, he had an excellent day out here shooting. And uh, uh, definitely a lot of fun, Chad. What do you think? Hey, I've had a great time. Got to see some great shooting and uh, look forward to a good show. Hey everyone, recently I shot my very first USPSA match. While it was a blast, it showed me one very glaring thing about my own shooting, even though I've been shooting for over 30 years, shooting handguns, it showed me one very glaring thing, that I basically sucked. Dang. Yeah, I sucked. With what you need, the, the agility, the quick thinking, the quick acquisition of your targets, uh, the quick trigger pulls, it's nothing like any form of static shooting, no matter how good you are at shooting at a gun range, just doing standard static shooting. So, with the current obvious ammo shortage, the amount of practice that I need to get any better is going to require quite a few trigger pulls. So what I decided to do, and I'm sure this has been done a million times, I'm just doing this my way. And believe me, I am not an expert. I am not an expert. This is what I decided to do on my own, on my budget, because I'm sure there's more expensive ways to practice than what I'm about to show you. This is what I decided to do with what I either had access to or could go get at a relatively decent price. I'm going to put together my own backyard shooting. I purchased an airsoft gun. Now, I'm not an airsofter, so all you airsoft, I don't want to say geeks because I don't mean that because now I guess technically I'm an airsoft geek, but all you airsoft experts out there. Go to another video. This is not the video that you want to watch. Airsoft guns, 129 bucks online, a thousand rounds, or I forget how many it is, six or seven bucks. Green gas is relatively inexpensive. You can use propane as long as you inject the silicone in there to keep the internals of your airsoft gun relatively lubricated. But overall, especially comparing it to a handgun shooting live rounds, it's extremely inexpensive. You don't get the recoil or the muzzle flip that you would have, obviously, shooting a live round, but you get everything else. So what I want to do is set up my own targets that I can shoot in my backyard in the city limits and not have anybody freaking out, although they'll probably still freak out, with some really some pretty inexpensive things. What I've got here is I have a handful of PVC, uh, three-quarter inch PVC. I've got some T's and some 90's. I've got some ratcheting clamps right here, eight of them. I'm going to build two targets, and I've got uh, four joints of three-quarter inch PVC pipe also. I also have um, a, an old target here that I've been shooting at. You can buy these. You can get a hundred of these for like 15 bucks. They're paper targets, but they're, they have the USPSA uh, IPSA little outline on them. I'm going to use that as my template to show me how wide I want to make my targets. Um, obviously, you want to make your target shoulder length, or shoulder height rather, so I'm going to be doing that. That's, that's already going to set my height, but this is going to set my width of my target. Very inexpensive. Uh, you see these items on here. Um, not expensive at all. I mean, this is something that if I can accomplish what I'm setting out to do, it's going to be pretty inexpensive as far as practicing versus trying to go to the gun range. And in most cases, gun ranges, you can't practice USPSA type shooting. You can only shoot static shots anyway. So from the action standpoint of it, or the practical shooting standpoint of it, I'll be able to accomplish this in my very own backyard. So I'm going to get started on this, I'm going to put it together, and then we're going to take it out in the backyard and see if I can freak some of my neighbors out by firing this a few times uh, in a safe position in my backyard where maybe my shop or my house or my fence can back it up and not send any of those little plastic pellets over the fence in anybody's backyard or in a swimming pool or anything like that. Well, we got two of these bad boys made up. Took us probably about 35 minutes total. I actually had miscounted my 90s here. I was six short, so I had to run back to the lumber store to grab uh, six more. But all in all, as far as cutting time, it took, again, maybe 35 minutes. And that was with a hacksaw. Uh, all of you plumbing ninjas out there, you probably got something that'll cut through it a lot quicker than that. A uh, hacksaw cutting through three quarter inch PVC goes pretty quick anyway, so it wasn't that big of a deal. Um, I hand fit all these, I didn't glue any of them. Uh, I may glue them uh, 
because of the way they're put together, they hand fit just fine. They fit nice and tight. I did that in case you ever want to break them down uh, and, and haul them somewhere. What I may do is go ahead and glue the bottoms of it since they lay flat anyway and just hand fit these tops as they fit into the base of it. Uh, we'll see. We'll see if it's necessary. Man, I didn't need to glue them at all. It's probably only a high wind situation. If the wind's too high anyway, you're not going to be able to keep the paper on here. So I don't see that that's going to be totally necessary. But let's take these suckers out in the backyard and see what we can do. Okay, as you can see, I have both of my targets set up here. I've got one about five yards further back than this one right here. As you can see, I put my, my clamps on here. I, I rolled, it was able, I guess, wide enough and long enough that I was able to roll the paper back on the back side and hold it from the back too so that it's actually holding clamping around the PVC pipe on the bottom as well just it's on on the side obviously here um, what I did was um, in case you're going to use say a cardboard USPSA cutout I assume that these letters these uh, lines rather right here pretty much determined where that this is I'm assuming this is the right size is what I'm saying so I made this thing a little bit narrower than the paper so that if I ever wanted to use a piece of cardboard, which I plan to, uh, it would also fit. It's just a matter of wrapping the paper around. Uh, we wouldn't want it to be too wide so that you couldn't reach the cardboard with these particular clamps. So that, that's why this is done like this, a little bit narrow for the paper, uh, again, to accommodate the cardboard later on. I wanted to show you uh, LET, Law Enforcement Targets Incorporated, Targeting for a Safer America. Uh, you can get a whole box of these things. Uh, 50 of them, I believe. 50, uh, I'm pretty sure it's 50. For like $15 or something like that. I'm not sure exactly what it is. But uh, anyway, relatively cheap. You'll notice we've got houses in the far background on each side over here. But I have these, these targets are backed up with my shop in my backyard. So if it hits anything, it's not going to hurt anything, obviously, because it's just a little plastic pellet. But nevertheless, it's not going to go into anybody's yard unless, which is quite possible, a really bad shooter uh, happens to totally miss that target and swing it over the fence over there. Uh, unlikely, but again, considering the operator of the weapon, it's, it's possible. So uh, anyway, trying to keep safety in mind, uh, kids in some of these yards, and I don't want these pellets flying over and hitting them, even though obviously it's not going to hurt them, but if it hits somebody in the eye or something like that, I mean, it, it, could, it, it could irritate somebody. Uh, nevertheless, it can be done in your backyard, but I recommend backing it up with something, whether it's your house uh, or a shop, in my case, or something like that, or even your wooden fence, because um, these things are low enough to where a six-foot wood, wooden fence would still be higher than the actual target. So uh, let's see how they work. Okay, I've got my airsoft gun here. This gun, I purchased this particular style on purpose because I have an STI Edge on order. That's the same basic 2011 style as this with the flared magwell and uh, basically the whole setup looks the same except for it shoots big name bullets. So uh, that's why I have this particular style right here. Um, they make tons of them. Um, you can get really cheap ones. I just wanted to get one that would last a while because this, if this works and it seems to be effective and helpful, I intend to use this gun quite a bit to practice here in my backyard. I've got a magazine full of pellets. Uh, we're good on gas. so. Let's see how this thing works. Let's try that again. Not bad. This target right here, I was probably only a few yards from it. So uh, not a hard shot. Uh, <laughs> still got to see. Uh, nevertheless, it, it seemed to work pretty good. Um, giving you those distances between the two. These two targets are five yards apart. So you notice my hesitation on my second shot, because it my second target rather, because it's not quite as close and takes a little bit more, I guess, uh, time to engage that target. So pretty cool. I'm going to use these things quite a bit. Uh, may show some video later on of me uh, moving around a little bit more instead of shooting a, a static shot like that. But I just wanted to show how cool these things were set up and how they are, they're somewhat functional and in the, intend on wearing these things out. I like to picture Jesus as a ninja fighting off evil samurai. Doug, you're strolling here with a pretty impressive record down in southwest Louisiana. Uh, what do you bring with you as far as awards and things that people may not know about you that, that actually don't pay attention to this sport enough? 
Well, you know, I've been shooting for over 25 years now. I've won uh, 14 NRA Bianchi Cups, five NRA World Action Championships, three World Speed Shooting Championships, and an Ipsic World Championship, and some other three-gun uh, national championships. So, you know, I've been doing it a long time. I've been very fortunate, and uh, I've strung together some good, good matches. From what we could see, you were shooting really well today. Now, one of the things that probably stood out to me the most, and I actually mentioned it, mentioned it to Chad, was how smooth you are and how deliberate you are whenever you're shooting. Uh, a lot of shooters that we see at these competitions are real aggressive, and they're probably a little bit too jerky whenever they're trying to, to I guess, acquire a little bit of speed. You were just so smooth. It's like, like glass. Tell me a little bit about how you, you come to that and determine that, look, smooth is a whole lot faster than trying to be fast. Well, you know, in my opinion, you know, smooth is fast. So... If you're smooth and consistent, it actually gives you a little bit more time, especially on the mover, on the target, you know, presentation. Um, you know, for me, if it didn't feel smooth today, I felt like I was a little bit rushed and I was pushing a little hard. It's early in the season for me. But, um, you know, I really try to focus on that in my training and my practice to be smooth and consistent and efficient with my time as I'm addressing the target, whether it's on the mover or on the practical or anything for that matter, because sooner and cleaner I can get the gun up and mount it and get it on the target, you know, the more style I'm going to have to work the trigger. Tell us a little bit about the gear you're shooting today. What, what, what do you bring to the table whenever you're out there performing? Well, for NRA action pistol shooting, I'm shooting a Smith & Wesson uh, Performance Center 1911. This gun is uh, chambered in 38 Super. Uh, I've got a loophole scope on top and I'm using Safari Land holster and belt and uh, pouches. So, you know, to me, it's the, it's the top level stuff. I need the best equipment. It has to work 100% of the time because there's no alibis in this sport. You know, whatever happens, you have to eat it, whether it's, you know, equipment or between the years. One last thing for anybody that may be interested in competing at the level, obviously it'll be a while before they compete at your level, but competing in this sport, what's the best advice you could give them? You know, the best advice is just get involved, um, go online, look for local ranges that hold competition shooting. And the nice thing about the shooting sports, you know, as opposed to maybe some other sports is, you know, you can get hooked up with any type of club and people are more than willing to help you out, lend you equipment, take you, you know, teach you through things and just show you the basics and kind of get you involved. That's how I was introduced to it. I didn't know anything about competition shooting and some local shooters, you know, took me under their wing and kind of you know, showed me what needed to be done and how to do it. And, you know, all I can say is do a lot of dry fire and get familiar with your equipment. And when you do get to the range, take advantage of your shooting time. I like to picture Jesus as a ninja fighting off evil samurai. Hey everybody and welcome to the show. We're going to talk a little bit about universal background checks. Everybody's been listening to a lot of the rhetoric going on around uh, all over the country right now and even the world for that matter. They're all looking at us, talking about us right now. We're talking about universal background checks in a way that paints it in such a shiny, perfumey, fluffy kind of way that makes you feel like you know, of course we should want these things. Your girl Barack Obama the other day just said, you know, why else wouldn't we want to keep guns out of the hands of criminals and uh, I don't know what else he said, but you get the feeling for what I'm saying. They're painting this as a why wouldn't we want to do this kind of issue. It's more than a why wouldn't we want to do this kind of issue. Make no mistake about it. It's not as fluffy and fuzzy and cotton candy that they make it seem to be. A universal background check is much more than what they're claiming it is. The average American who doesn't own a gun or who, who has never filled out a form, an ATF 4473 form, they may not know that there are already background checks. In other words, you can be a gun owner without ever having purchased a gun or for that matter, even filled out an ATF form because you may have bought it from, from a private individual. If you were given a gun by a parent, a grandfather, a friend, or anybody like that, you wouldn't have filled out an FFL form. Well, if you keep hearing, if you've never had to fill out a 4473, and that's the NICS, the National Instant Criminal Background System, that, that's the acronym they use, the NICS, 
when you go through that NICS process, you fill out a 4473. That's an ATF uh, mandated form that everybody that purchases a gun through a federal firearms licensed dealer has to fill out. Well, if you've never filled one of those out, but you own guns, you may be a gun supporter, but you also may, may be someone that says, you know what, we do need to have universal background checks because of course we want to do background checks. We already do background checks. You may not know that. And, and I'm not speaking condescendingly to those of you that don't know that who are gun supporters, but we do have a, a background check system. Again, it's the NICS. When you fill out that 4473, you're not just filling it out. I know this is redundant to everybody out there who's purchased guns, but for those of you that haven't, just bear with me. You go in, you fill out this form, this 4473, uh, again, it's the ATF form. You don't just file the paperwork. You have to hand it to the person who you're wanting to buy the gun from. And I say wanting to buy the gun from because they don't have to sell you the gun. Plus, you have to wait for this 4473 to be called in. By called in, what I mean is you have to stand there and wait. They make a phone call to a live human being who is going through that checklist, taking all of your personal information, your social security number, of course that speeds it up, you don't have to give me your social security number, taking all this personal information and all of the, the answers that you filled out, yes or no, or the additional information of your address and things like that, they're taking all this in and they're punching into a system. You're getting a background check. Your background check is being performed as you stand there. And they do not approve everybody. There are some huge statistics out there that show how many millions of people who have been denied, it's, it's in the millions, uh, denied sales of handguns. Where they use this caveat of, of throwing universal in there to make it sound like, ah, oh, we've got background checks, but we don't have uni universal background checks. It's because, and they call this the gun show loophole. I know you've heard that a lot of times. Universal background check and gun show loophole are directly connected. Now, both of them are blown out of proportion, but both of them have significant rele relevance to one another. A gun show loop, or the gun show loophole rather, is the fact that even though when you go to a gun show, it's loaded with FFL dealers, federal firearms licensed dealers. It's loaded with them. Most of them are there to sell their, their guns using their federal firearms license uh, license when you go to their table or their booth or whatever to purchase a gun you say i want to buy that gun they hand you the same nics form the 4473 that you would have filled out if you went to their place of business to purchase that very same gun nothing changes doesn't matter if it's a used gun or a new gun if you go to somebody who is an ffl dealer they're going to hand you the same piece of paper and go through that same process including that very same phone call Nothing changes. Where people have this misconception of the gun show loophole is that if you buy a gun from a gun show, let's say some guy is walking through the aisle and he just purchased a gun, or let's say he just brought a gun from his house and he's looking to get rid of it and maybe buy a different gun because he's not happy with the one he has. Most of them will walk around with a sign that has what type of gun it is or it has the price on it or something like that. You know, you can spot a guy who's selling a gun at a gun show pretty easily. It's not exactly a hard thing to find. That's a private transfer. It's not necessary to fill out that 4473. That's the main area that they're talking about. Well, that is the area where they're talking about a gun show loophole. Now, they make it sound like this gun show loophole is huge. There are people out there that have this misconception that when you walk in the door of a gun show, I don't have to fill out a 4473. There's no record of me purchasing a gun. Absolutely false. Absolutely untrue. You most certainly do have to fill out a 4473. It doesn't change. A very good friend of mine owns a local gun shop here in town, and he's told me that very same thing. He's had somebody come up to him to purchase a gun from his booth at a gun show before and said, well, when you're handing the 4473, why are you handing me that 4473? I don't have to fill that out here. Because this guy thought that, oh, the gun show loophole applied here. When I walked in these doors, I don't have to fill one out. No, you have to. You still got to fill one out. You're being misled to believe that gun shows, the rules don't apply when you walk in the door to gun show. And that's absolutely false. And they're writing that. They're, actually, they're writing the ignorance. And I'm going to go one step further, writing the stupidity of people out there not to do their own research to realize that a gun show loophole is not a carte blanche 
um, rule when you walk in that you don't have to fill any out. It's just for private sales. They shouldn't be calling it the gun show loophole. They should be calling it the private sale or private transfer loophole. That's what they ought to be calling and it's not a loophole. The same law does not apply for private sales. It's a private sale. If you started requiring, and we're getting into what they want to do on the universal background check here. If you started applying that 4473 form to every private sale. Now, of course, your girl Barack Obama wants to say that the private sales he's really talking about is those illegal gun sales. Those illegal gun sales uh, down in the hood or uh, in the back roads or something like that where that gun's going to be purposely used for a crime. That's bull. That's bull. Those gun sales, they're saying that, oh, I want to say that the fictitious number that I heard was 40% of all gun sales are somehow private gun sales and gun transfers. Absolutely false. Barack Obama tried to use that number here recently and immediately even some of his own people, uh, and when I say his own people, I'm talking about people in the media, they even debunked it. They even said, that's ah, not true, that's an old number. That number actually exists from the early 1990s. He got that number from the 1990s. He's saying 40%. They actually looked at those numbers and actually the questionnaire that was filled out back then, it, it was a poll. It was just a poll. They got those numbers from a poll. It was like, do you think you might have bought that gun from a, a private individual? Do you think you might have bought it from an FFL? Do you think? It was all real, it, it was so open-ended that there was no way that you could take any of the answers that were answered and apply them as a fact. It wasn't a yes or no. They were all maybes. So even, even that poll was so flawed and they determined that back then, there are people that say it's more like 10 to 20% of private sales. But that's, that's besides the fact. A lot of the guns, I think they said 90% of guns used in crimes, and again, this is somebody else's poll, so I guess you can take one side with a grain of salt just like you take the other side with a grain of salt. But they've determined that 90% of guns used in crimes are stolen guns. Here we go again with the law only applies to those of us who follow the law. Those 90% crimes would have still taken place. There's no shortage of guns on the street. And it's got nothing to do with legal gun sales. What a universal background check will do, it's going to criminalize private gun sales and endowments. It's also going to, and, and, and everybody's going to balk at this, it creates basically a de facto gun registration. Of course it does. Go back to number one. If we have every gun all of a sudden, private or, and I say private, you know what I mean, it's one of these brother-in-law sells to brother-in-law or even a transfer as far as I'm giving you this gun to my son. If every one of those transactions where a gun changes hands, if every one of those transactions has to be handled through an FFL, for that law to stick, to have any teeth and to mean something, suddenly another level of government has to be created to know where those guns are and who's supposed to be in, uh, in possession of that particular gun at that time. How else can you do that without a registry of gun owners, guns, locations of those owners, locations of the guns? How else can you do that? I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I don't look at this as being a list that the government is trying to slide in so they can come take my guns, but it's absolutely a list. It absolutely is. And it's absolutely gun registration. Now, whatever their motive is, and it may be just that sinister, but whatever their motive, meaning the gun grabbers, maybe gun confiscation is the next step. I'm not suggesting that. What I'm saying is this is absolutely registration of guns. There's no question about it. Again, you cannot enforce, you cannot enforce NICS laws or rules by having a, for, a Form 4473 filled out on every private purchase as well as a, 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 a retail purchase. You cannot enforce that if you don't know where every gun is and you don't know who owns every gun and where that gun owner lives. You can't enforce it. So you, by default, have to create a gun registry. It has to happen. It's an inventory system.
You have to create an inventory system to know where your inventory is. Otherwise, what's the point of even having it? And even gun grabbers will tell you that. Well, they'd be the first ones to tell you that we have to create a registration system to make number one work. Without number two, number one doesn't work. Now, out of the guns that I own, there are probably, um, I'd say five to six. And here we go, I'm outing myself. There are probably five to six that have been handed down to me from my dad that I can't prove ownership to. Heck, he probably couldn't prove ownership to. Now, one of them, I've even got the instruction manual. It's an old, old pistol, uh, an army version of a Colt. I've got the owner's manual even, but I don't have a receipt and I cannot prove my dad purchased the gun. I know he did. I have rifles, I have shotguns that were handed down to me. I have shotguns that I bought 20 years ago, but I have absolutely no proof that I own them other than the, the form that I might have filled out. But I don't have any, any, I don't have a receipt to prove that I owned it. Those guns, if I don't, if they pass a universal background check, if I don't declare those guns and say that I have these guns, then those guns are suddenly illegal for me to own because they are not declared. There's no way for them to know who has them. And before you call BS on that, let me tell you this. What if I decide to sell one? Of course they have to be registered because it circumvents the whole system. If everybody out there, if you grandfather everybody in, oh, well, all the guns you have now, of course you don't have to fill out a 4473 for those. You had those already. We're grandfathered. No, you can't grandfather these guns in because they claim that half the guns in America, there's no proof of ownership. So you're not going to eliminate. They're not going to allow If they're allowed to pass a gun control law and any kind of background check, they're not going to eliminate half the guns in America. They want to include every one of them. And there's a reason for that because half of those guns in America that you sudden, they suddenly become illegal guns. If you can't prove that you bought that gun and, and you, it belongs to you now, it is an illegal gun. You're not by law now allowed to have it. So what do you do? Give it back to the government. It's their gun now. Now, let's say you're one of those ones that will probably keep those guns and not declare them. Well, when you get found out that you have one of those guns, let's say you get stopped uh, and you have one of those guns in your vehicle and they find that, I'm talking about a traffic stop. Uh, let's say something happens where, I don't know, you're out hunting and a game warden stops you with that shotgun that your grandfather gave to you that you didn't declare to the federal government because you didn't want them knowing you had it. Let's say you, you get stopped with that. And let's say it's an innocent stop. The game warden runs all your serial numbers and all that kinds of stuff. Suddenly you are in possession of either an illegal or they will cons uh, may consider it a stolen gun. There's no record of anybody owning that gun so you may be thinking, well, if nobody owns it, it's no big deal. No, there's no record of you owning it either. You are in possession of an illegal weapon at that point. Guess what you just became? You just became a felon. Not only will you not be able to, to own any of those guns that you may have declared to the government or you may have proof that you have uh, from additional guns that you bought since they passed their universal background check, now you've got to give all those guns back. You just became a felon. You'll be lucky if you don't spend time in jail, not to mention the fine that you're going to receive. They'll take all your guns and then you're a felon now. Guess what you can't do? You can't own guns anymore, which means you can't purchase anymore. You worried about ammo? You can't own a gun anymore. That's where this universal background check is going. It makes felons out of all of us who have done everything the right way throughout our lives in regards to guns. It makes felons out of us. I like to picture Jesus as a ninja fighting off evil samurai. Hey guys, we had a great time out here at the Crawfish Cup. Chad, what do you think? Great event, great shooting, great competitions. We're going to see you guys next time. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, of course, want to point everybody to our website. Yeah, don't forget to check us out online, legallyarmedamerica.com. You'll find reviews, 
copies of our shows. Check it all out online. And look, if anybody else wants to out there wants to write for the show, uh, write for the website or anything like that, we're always looking for correspondence. So email us at info at legallyarmedamerica.com and uh, let us know you're interested. We'll be happy to have you on board. We're looking for people all over the country. So it doesn't matter where you're from or what your, your likeness is as far as guns. Just as long as you like guns in the gun community, that's the kind of people that we're looking for.